Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the End of Smile podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Kisa Iqbal, and today I'm very excited about today's topic. Drum roll, please. We're going to be talking about regenerative endodontics. And basically, I came across this topic because I deal with a lot of pediatric patients, and sometimes managing them can be quite difficult. So I started to look into how to manage some of the cases and realized that this is a very uh, popular topic in the field of endodontics. There's a lot of research around it. And so we're going to talk about it in detail, and hopefully you become more excited about it just as much as I am. So the primary source that I used to create this presentation was published by the AAE in the year 2013. So the big picture idea behind regenerative endodontics is that we're dealing with an immature permanent tooth um, that has experienced pulpal necrosis. And here, let me get out my pointer. Um, this image here was taken from the 2004 paper initially published by Bonks and Trope, and it was a very um, pilot study. Um, and here, if we focus around tooth number 29, we can appreciate the radiolucency and the open apex, and we're going to see how we can manage cases like this. Some of the challenges to these pediatric um, immature teeth is that the root canal can be difficult to deprive because there's thin dentinal walls and there's an increased risk of cervical fracture. And also we know that in pediatric patients, implants are contraindicated. In this image here, you can see the thin dentinal walls and we also see the incomplete root uh, development. And we can also appreciate the highly vascularization and the innervation related to the pulp tissue. In 2017, Murray really defined what regenerative endodontics is, and it's defined as biologically based procedures designed to replace damaged structures, including dentin and root structures, as well as cells of the pulp dentin complex. And oftentimes, regenerative endodontics can be synonymous with revitalization and revascularization. In this presentation, I'm going to refer, be referring to them as REPs, which stand for regenerative endodontic procedures. So again, from that same um, article, our goal is to take a tooth that looks something like this in panel A, perform these REP procedures in hopes of getting a result like this. And we're going to basically talk into detail about how um, panel B is the desired outcome. So there's about four main goals behind regenerative endodontics. Firstly, we want to resolve the signs and symptoms the patient's experiencing. Next, we want to heal the apical periodontitis. Thirdly, we want continued development of the root apex. And fourth, we want increased thickness of the root canal wall. So in this article, which was published by Dr. Hargreaves and his colleagues in 2008, we can see that there's evidence of radiolucency around tooth number 28, 29. Um, there's an open apex. You can really appreciate those thin dentinal walls. And after performing REPs, we see that there is healing of the apical periodontitis um, in terms of if we see the decrease in radiolucency, there's closure of the um, root apex and also an increased thickness of those root canal walls. So again, we wanna take something that goes, that looks like this upon presentation and uh, end up with our end result that looks like this. So what inspired the field of REPs? So firstly, they found that the blood clot um, plays a huge role in endotherapy. We also found that revascularization plays an important role in the root development. Third, we saw how mesenchymal stem cells um, can actually perform odontogenic-like cell lines. And fourthly, there was a lot of advances in tissue engineering. So I made this quick schematic highlighting how three of these factors work in conjunction with one another. So the three main things that we are focusing in on when we're talking about tissue engineering is number one, stem cells, number two, scaffolds, and thirdly, growth factors. And we're gonna talk into detail about each of them. So firstly, in stem cells, the research shows that there's actually multiple areas where stem cells can be found. Some of those being pulp stem cells, deciduous teeth, periodontal ligament, periodontal follicle. But what I want you to focus on is SCAPS, which stands for stem cells from the apical papilla. And you can also see that here. And what SCAPS are, are basically, they have some role in pulp and dentin regeneration. This was taken from the article published by Dr. George Huang. And what they found, this is an immature third molar with um, open, immature apices. And what they did was they isolated the apical papilla and they actually found that stem cells reside in this area. And those are those scaps that I was just mentioning earlier. 
Next, I want to talk about scaffolds. So scaffolds support, uh, they provide support for cell organization, proliferation, differentiation, and vascularization. And there's multiple ways that scaffolds can be used. Dentin can be used, blood clot, uh, platelet-rich plasma, and we also have natural and synthetic scaffolds. Some natural scaffolds include collagen, hyaluronic acid, and chitin. Um, some synthetic scaffolds include uh, hydroxyapatite, nanofibers, and fibrin gels, to name a few. Thirdly, I want to talk about the role of growth factors. So growth factors induce cell proliferation and differentiation. Here I wrote down EDTA. So researchers found that 17% EDTA can actually liberate growth factors. So what happens is when there's um, curious uh, exposure and insult, those growth factors get trapped into the dentinal tubules. And what EDTA does is basically liberate those growth factors from the dentinal tubules. And the growth factors can be found in platelets and dentin, some of them being BMPs, TGF betas, and FGF, and there's a, a lot more. Those are just an, a few. All right, so before um, regenerative endodontics, uh, apexification was used. So in apexification, you do form a calcified barrier. It is for a non-vital tooth. However, um, there is an incomplete root formation. So if you look here, the tooth apex is not closed and root canals are infected. And so in apexification, the root canals are clean and a medigament is placed. That's in contrast with apexogenesis that deals with vital teeth. So it's not gonna be the focus of our discussion. So there's two main materials that can be used for apexification, one of them being calcium hydroxide. So calcium hydroxide has a high success rate of 95%, but there are some disadvantages. So we know that time is needed to form that calcified barrier. So it can take from three to 24 months to create that barrier. We also know that multiple appointments are required um, in order for you to reapply that calcium hydroxide. And also some of the literature shows that the long-term effects of calcium hydroxide dressing can actually weaken the dentinal walls and also um, increase the risk of fracture. So here, this is the pre-op image, and in B, this is the post-op image after calcium hydroxide apexification. So you can really see how thin those uh, dentinal walls are. So MTA, or mineral trioxide aggregate, is also a product used for apexification. It's a root and filling, and it forms a cementum-like heart tissue. The advantage it offers is that there's a reduction in treatment time compared to calcium hydroxide, and the success rate is pretty high, which is 94%. However, the long-term effects of MTA use are still unknown. So both of these um, options sound pretty good, but neither calcium hydroxide or MTA actually promote root development. And we mentioned that immature teeth are vulnerable to cervical root fractures. So if we look at this image here, again, if we place calcium hydroxide, it takes several visits um, for this procedure to basically form that apical seal. In this image with MTA, you need at least two visits. Um, this is a little bit more technique sensitive um, compared to calcium hydroxide placement, and the goal is to make that apical plug. So REPs offer advantages because they promote the development of the root and they may provide better long-term prognosis. So in this paper, um, this was tooth number four. And again, we see evidence of um, radiolucency, open apex, um, pulpal necrosis. And after regenerative endodontic procedures, we do see that thickening of the dentinal wall, the closure of the apex, and the continued development of the root. So how are REPs performed? So I'm going to make another video about the details of how to go about performing these procedures. I'm going to talk about the concentrations and the materials to use. But in a general sense, um, what you want to do is after you do the diagnosis and get the informed consent, in the first appointment, you want to use um, normal lidocaine uh, to gain anesthesia and you want to put on your rubber dam and gain access. Next, you want to use um, sodium hypochloride, about 1.5% to really irrigate, and you can place an intracanal medigament. So what's important here is because the dental walls are so thin, you actually don't want to instrument. The reason why is that those walls need to be preserved as much as possible. So you're actually using those irrigating agents to really disinfect the tooth. In the second appointment, you want to reevaluate those signs and symptoms. So, if you find that the the symptoms have um, the signs and symptoms have resolved, you can move forward with the with the um, procedure. 
If you find that those are still present, you want to reevaluate and you might consider doing uh, the first appointment again in terms of disinfecting the tooth again. In the second appointment, it's very important to use a local anesthesia without vasoconstrictor. So you can use something like 3% mepivacaine. And the reason why is that we actually want to stimulate bleeding. And so a vasoconstrictor might affect that. So mepivacaine, like I said, great option. Next, you want to use those 17% EDTA to release those growth factors from the dentin. Next, you want to stimulate bleeding by basically over-instrumenting about two millimeters past the apex. And what that does, it delivers stem cells um, to the site of action. Next, you can create a scaffold and a blood clot can act like a scaffold or platelet-rich plasma. And then next, you want to put an orifice sealer such as MTA, RMGI, or a biceramic root repair material putty. And finally, you want to make sure you have that permanent restoration, which is important. You want to make sure it's completely sealed off to any potential bacteria. So I um, basically made some edits to this, uh, to this diagram taken from this paper. And so here I added that you can use EDTA to release those growth factors. Um, like I said, you want to stimulate the bleeding by over-instrumenting about 2 millimeters, and that liberates some of those stem cells into the pulpal canal space. What happens is the blood flows into the canal to form that blood clot. And ideally, you want the blood to kind of pool to this level of the CEJ. The blood clot scaffolds invaded by cells and growth factors. And also, you want to make sure that you put RMGI or MTA. And then, like I said, you want to put that permanent coronal restoration to seal the tooth. And basically, the end goal is that you want to regenerate the pulp and regenerate the root as well. This image was taken from a paper in 2017 by Dr. Lewis Lin and his colleagues, and it just highlights that when you induce that apical bleeding, you do want it to come to the level about the CEJ. So REPs is a rapidly evolving field. So initially in the 2004 paper, triple antibiotic paste was used. And what that is, is it involves minocycline, ciprofloxacin, and metronidazole, and that constitutes the triple antibiotic pace. However, in a recent in vitro study, they found that triple antibiotic pace can actually be, was shown to be cytotoxic to stem, stem cells. Furthermore, we know that minocycline um, for some patients has been shown to be linked with staining. So minocycline might be uh, substituted for clindamycin, augmentin, um, and so, and also some patients just go ahead and use a double antibiotic paste of these two and um, not include the minocycline at all. So in multiple studies, they have shown the achievement of those four initial goals that I talked about. They did find absence of signs and symptoms, the resolution of periapical infections, the continued root development, and increased canal wall thickness. So in here, um, if we look at picture um, tooth number 29, we can appreciate that even though there's uh, the root development um, seems, a, seems a bit halted, there was, however, thickening in, of the canal space, resolution of the apical periodontitis, um, and absence of signs and symptoms. So this case was still considered successful. Cases would be considered failures if the patient presents with pain, soft tissue swelling, or increases in radiolucency. And an alternative to this procedure can be placing of an apical barrier using MTA or extraction. So another study which highlights the importance of REPs basically took 61 immature teeth. A group of them were treated with REPs and a group were treated with apexification using both calcium hydroxide and MTA. And they found that um, those teeth that were treated with REPs had an increased root length and thickness. So this just adds a little bit more validity to the point that we're trying to make. So where are we headed in terms of the future? So progenitor cells have been found in human inflamed pulps and periapical tissues, and this might play a role in future regenerative endodontic procedures. We also know that a lot of the literature deals with certain case series and case reports. So it's important that we hopefully be able to get prospective root uh, randomized control trials to really test these REPs. 
In this paper published in 2013, they found a positive response to cold and electric pulp tests, uh, which occurred in some cases. So really, this is the end goal that we're trying to take a tooth that's uh, in a state of necrosis and may basically make it uh, vital again, which is really um, incredible. This image was taken from a group from Dalhousie University in Canada. And in my discussion, I focused on panel B, which basically involved over-instrumenting with a file um, to stimulate that bleeding and uh, achieve the, uh, the uh, results that we want. That is a, basically a cell-free model. There's also a cell-based model, which is shown in uh, panel A. So in a cell-based model, you take stem cells and a scaffold and basically combine them outside of the tooth. And then you go ahead and inject them. And that is um, also another way in which regenerative endodontic procedures can be performed. So a quick summary of what we talked about. So first, we know calcium hydroxide and MTA can be used for apexification. However, REPs allow and offer a lot of advantages, one of them being the healing of apical periodontitis, the development of the apex, and increased thickness of dentinal walls. We also talked about how stem cells, scaffolds, and growth factors work in conjunction with one another to get that desired result that we're looking for. And lastly, we know that it's an incredibly growing field and there's a lot of research yet to be done. These are the multiple resources that I used to create this presentation. And that about wraps up uh, episode four. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you guys learned a lot. Uh, stay tuned for episode five, where I'm going to talk uh, about the details of how to go ahead and perform these REP procedures. Thank you so much. I wish you and your loved ones all the best. Keep smiling. Until next time. Bye.